Good afternoon and welcome to our uh, regular weekly webinar um, at Pay Entry. Today we're going to be talking about the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 that was just signed into law recently. Uh, my name is Kathy Graham and I'm the Senior VP of HR Services. Um, with us today also is Brianna Grimes. Don't have her picture up here, but she is the senior um, HR uh, consultant or advisor in our department. One thing I want to tell you today before we start is that I am not an attorney. What I'm going to be um, showing you today or sharing with you, uh, with you today um, are things that I've done research on and things that I think our clients need to know. Uh, about the upcoming legislate or the upcoming laws and the changes that are coming so that you can react to them um, in a proper way. But I am not an attorney, so um, take what I say with a grain of salt. Okay, Congress approved um, this um, American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 on March the 10th, and then President Biden was quick to sign it on uh, March the 11th. So it did not linger very long on the president's desk. I'm going to talk to you today about the components of the act that impact businesses today um, in the next year. The first one we're going to talk about is one that we weren't really um, expecting, and that was a, a COBRA continuation coverage subsidy. Also, the dependent care um, flexible spending account limit has been increased, which hasn't happened since it, the inception of the law. Um, there were slight modifications to the PPP process, an extension of the FFCRA uh, tax credits for um, uh, employee leaves, and the extension of the employee retention tax credit. Also, there was an extension of the pandemic unemployment assistance. And a new thing that we um, weren't expecting was a restaurant revitalization fund. Now, I know that probably um, many of you are, are, don't have a restaurant to run, but we have a lot of clients that do have small businesses that are restaurants. So I thought I would include this in here today. Okay, so let's start with the COBRA subsidy. You know, there was a COBRA sub subsidy years ago, um, and um, that's long gone. I think it was back during the um, recent um, recession when a lot of people were out of work. But now that a lot of people, again, are out of work, um, there is a 100% COBRA subsidy for the period of April the 1st through September the 30th of 2021. And those of you who have more than 20 employees know that you have to comply with COBRA regulations and probably will want to reach out to your COBRA third-party administrator or vendor to uh, get some information from them also. Under this act, the employer is required to pay for coverage and then be reimbursed quarterly with a 100% tax credit for those employees who lose coverage because of a layoff, a reduction of hours, or termination of employment other than voluntary. So if someone leaves voluntary, you do not have to do this. However, I've been reading some um, legal um, briefs on this subsidy and attorneys are pretty much um, saying that it might be a good idea to go ahead and offer it to everybody other than those who you discharge for uh, gross misconduct and you can still not offer COBRA in that respect. One of the uh, more interesting things about this subsidy is that it does give those who have already been offered COBRA, but maybe turned it down to elect COBRA now. So that means that the COBRA companies are gonna be pretty busy because they're going to be sending out retroactive election coverages. And when I said retroactive election, I mean those who were eligible for it before, they cannot start it, their coverage before April the 1st, but it will allow them to opt back in because um, I believe that there was a feeling that those who lost their job couldn't afford COBRA 
Um, that's why they didn't elect it. So the subsidy will allow them to elect. So if they previously did not elect COBRA or they previously elected COBRA and dropped the coverage, if the coverage period would have extended beyond April the 1st of 2021, then you need to go back and offer them uh, either reinstatement or uh, a new offer of coverage um, for the time um, uh, April the 1st. Your COBRA administrators will have a lot more information on that, on how you're going to comply with that. So I would reach out to them about that. Um, there is an opportunity to offer um, those who are, are covered the chance to, to change their election. If they did not include a dependent or they chose a lower cost plan, maybe they want to change it to a higher cost plan now, there will be the opportunity for the, them to do that at this point. So it's a little complicated, but very straightforward. Employers will be using um, probably a, um, some sort of a, a code uh, within the payroll system once that's developed to be able to recover the tax credit that is uh, created or the, um, by the um, subsidies that you're paying for. So you would continue to pay for their coverage through the carrier and then be reimbursed by the, the government. Um, as a reminder too, we have a questions block on your um, uh, side view. And if you want to type questions in there, we will be answering questions at the end of this presentation. We will also be uh, sending you a copy of the presentation um, as a recording. And if you want a PDF of the file, um, just let me know and I'll send you that also. We had a technical difficulty earlier and could not get it to upload. So um, we will send that out to you if you'd rather have a PDF. Okay, now let's talk about the dependent care FSA limit. In the, the limit has always been $5,250 for um, married individuals um, who file separately, but it was a combination. The, the maximum uh, was $5,250. So um, employees had to split it up 26, 25, or one of them would take it. One of the um, married individuals would take it and the other wouldn't. But now the maximum is $10,500 for single taxpayers and 5250 for married individuals who file separately. So it's just about double. Um, this is for plan years that begin after December the 31st of 2020 and end, uh, I'm sorry, and before uh, January 1st of 2022. So it is for the um, plan years for the most part, January 1 and forward. Your plan may not renew until March or April or July. So that's when you would be able to make this change in your plan. Some small modifications to the payroll protection program. Um, they did increase funding. Um, to almost $814 billion. So there's more money available for these PPP loans. Um, this clarified that eligible, that nonprofit organizations are um, still eligible for these loans. And it does expand the eligibility to include labor organizations, social and recreational clubs, and fraternal benefit societies. And this one extended the FFCRA tax credits. They were extended in the Consolidated Appropriations Act um, that, that occurred in January. Um, this increases them um, and makes it clearer um, how much is available. But for paid sick leave, the emergency paid sick leave, the law continues to allow employers that have less than 500 employees to provide paid leave for certain COVID-related reasons through September the 30th of 2021 now. So if you are an employer that voluntarily wants to continue these paid leave programs and get your tax credits um, to offset the cost, you can certainly do that if you have less than 500 employees and um, you would 
just do it the way that you're doing it currently. The 100% tax credit applies just as it has, so the rules for that are not changing. But there is a reset of paid leave. So if the employee has, has already used their 10 days in 2021 or part of them in 2020, I'm sorry, in 2020 or 2021, it permits the employer to provide an additional 10 days to an employee who's already used it back in 2020. And that is a change from the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And remember now, this extension of tax credits is voluntary. If you as an employer don't want to or uh, one of the other reasons that are allowed under the FFCRA rules, then you would get 100% tax credit up to a certain amount. This act does expand the types of leave to include time off to obtain a COVID vaccine, and that is four hours, up to four hours, and then time off after to recover from any reaction to the immunization. So those are changes in this. Also, time off to receive a test result. So if someone has been exposed, you want them to quarantine, um, it will allow you to pay them for that time and get a tax credit. And um, the emergency family medical leave um, has been extended, plus the two-week waiting period has been waived. So the first 10 days have been waived. And I'm not sure why they did that, because they still have the paid um, sick leave up front, which gives you the 10 days, but the two week waiting period is waived. This also doesn't mean that they double up and get sick leave and family medical leave at the same time. It does raise the aggregate cap from 10,000 to 12,000 for this leave. And there are some new non-discrimination rules this time around. Um, you may not discriminate in favor of highly compensated employees, full-time employees, or based on employment tenure, how long someone has worked for your company. So this is a new piece in here, and the extra $2,000 maximum um, on the aggregate for this family medical leave, because it is 12 weeks. The employee retention tax credit has been extended. Um, this doesn't extend the tax credit through 1231 of 2021. And this is a tax credit you get can get for uh, and pay your employees. Um, you have to qualify for the uh, employee retention tax credit. And we are doing a, a um, webinar in the next two weeks on that subject. So um, you might want to tune in if you need a refresher. We also have a webinar on that um, on our website at www.payentry.com under webinars. If you're interested in any of our past webinars, please look there and um, you'll be able to find them. So this extends the tax credit. It is $7,000 now credit maximum for four quarters. So that is $7,000 times each employee you have for the next four quarters. You will get a tax credit for that amount. I asked a stupid question this morning of someone here, our tax department, and um, found out that the answer is, is pretty straightforward. If I said, what if they don't have enough tax, they don't pay enough taxes to get this tax credit that's coming through uh, for them, and you would get a check for it. Um, you would get a rebate check from the IRS. So it's not that it, it it, if you're out of taxes that you paid, it stops. It does give you um, um, a check or a credit for that. This um, ERTC um, change expands the eligibility to new startups that are established February the 15th of 2020 and um, companies 
whose revenue has declined by 90% compared to the same calendar quarter of the prior year. So if you were a startup established after February the 15th and your revenue has declined by 90% compared to the same calendar quarter of last year, then you would be able to uh, apply for that. This credit is capped at $50,000 per calendar quarter for startups. And again, once again, um, the federal pandemic unemployment assistance has been extended. Um, that federal add-on add -on of $300 a week is good through September the 6th of this year. The reason I included that in, the, in what impacts an employer um, webinar is that this does impact you because it makes it harder to get people to come to work. They're making more on unemployment than they would if they came to work. So it does present um, a negative um, aspect on this. It's a deterrent to getting people back to work. This does increase the number of weeks from 50 to 79 for those who have exhausted the state benefits. And there's no change to eligibility for those who do not qualify for state unemployment. That's like self-employed um, people, gig workers, and the like. This is something that will have everyone amending their tax returns, but don't do that until you get um, some uh, details from the IRS, which are obviously not out yet, but the first $10,200 of unemployment funds received in 2020 are free of federal taxes if you earned less than $150,000 last year. Um, there is a posting on the IRS website that says don't amend your taxes right now, wait for guidance. Um, it does take the IRS a while to put the details out for both payroll companies and employees so that we can make sure we're doing everything correctly the first time that we do it. So um, some of our systems are having to be updated now and uh, we're working on that um, as we speak. And last, the re uh, Restaurant Revitalization Fund. Um, there is 28 point billion dollar in grant money uh, that specifically targets restaurants and bars. So if you don't have a restaurant or a bar, and but you know someone does, just let them know that there is available uh, grant money uh, for their business. Restaurants are able to apply for these grants based on lost revenue between 2019 and 2020. The maximum grant size will be $5 million for restaurants and bars and $10 million for restaurant groups. So if you are, have a group of restaurants, you will be able to get twice as much money. And I think that that's a good thing because restaurants and bars have been hit especially hard by all of this. So what should employers do? This is how we like to wrap these legal things up. First of all, talk to your vendor or third-party administrator about the process of notifying those who have the opportunity to re-elect COBRA. They should be preparing for that. And make sure that they come up with new notices and letters that are compliant with the new law. Then consider your participation in the extension of these paid leaves, both the paid emergency paid sick leave and the emergency family medical leave. And if you do participate, you will receive 100% credit for the most part. Um, there are still some limits on that that were um, indicated in the first release of the, the law, but you can continue to participate that in that and um, get the benefit of not having to pay your employees out of your own pocket. Take advantage of any employee retention tax credits there that are available to your company. Um, there are some retroactive 2020 credits available that a lot of people are asking about and filing now. So look into that. 
amend your plan documents for your um, flexible spending accounts to include the new dependent care limits when your plan renews. And you should just reach out to your um, FSA provider. They, they should be working on, on those documents already. For restaurants and bars, consider applying for um, the RRF grant. Um, it's kind of a no-brainer. If you need the money and you were you didn't have a business for the most part, you need to apply for those loans or grants. These are actually grants. Okay, with that, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Brianna, would you like to facilitate that? Yes, absolutely. Thanks for all the great information, Kathy. Uh, we do have a couple questions that we are okay. getting in. For the first question, um, if an employee was laid off in April of 2020, do we have to go back to those employees regarding COBRA and notify them? Yes, because they're, if they started their COBRA in April of last year, their 18 months would not be up yet. So they would be entitled to elect or um, to make a change in what the benefits that they have right now. Okay. So, so it's as long as they're not outside of their normal 18 months after they lost coverage. Gotcha. Okay. Um, still on that COBRA track, another question, is the COBRA subsidy for medical only? No, it's not. Uh, there was no indication in the law that it was just for medical. So it would be inclusive you offer under COBRA. Okay. Uh, next question we had is, if the employee used their 10 days in 2021, does this allow an extra 10 days as well? So if they've already used those 10 days up to this point, does it reset? I would say no, um, because there was the rollover of, of what they used um, if they, well, let me let me restate this. If the if the 10 days were from the for the fact that they didn't use it in 2020, yes, they would get another 10 days in 2021. But if they used 10 days last year and you gave them another 10 days this year, or they used five days last year and you allowed them um, to use five days this year, um, then they would only get a maximum of 10 days in 2021. But if it was carryover from last year, they can use the 10 days and get another 10 days. Gotcha. Okay. Um, do we need to apply for the employee retention tax credit? If so, where can we go to do so? Um, go to the IRS website. It's um, irs.gov forward slash ERTC and it will give you the rules for filing there. What you would do is come up with the um, wages that you want to apply toward the credit. Once you get those wages, you would contact your client advocate at pay entry and they will facilitate that process for you. But you would need to come up, you decide which quarter, you decide how much, and then you would just send um, us the information. So there's no website to go to to apply for it. You just um, contact your Q, uh, your CA and they will set it up for you. Gotcha, okay. Um, someone sent in that they don't see the employee retention tax credit um, as an upcoming webinar for next month. Um, is that one we still have to post on our website, Kathy? That's probably a question that you had, Brianna, because you post all of those. I think, yeah, it's probably going to be a special one because we're getting so many questions about it. So it is not posted yet. Okay, perfect. Um, we are posting the rest of our April schedule on Monday. Um, so, Kathy, if you have a date already in mind on when you want to do it, we can post it on Monday. Um, but if not, guys, stay tuned. We will send you out a special email just like we did with this one, yes. um, kind of mm -hmm. letting you know that topic is coming. So you won't miss it, I promise. <laughs> All right, um, for reimbursable type of employer unemployment accounts, is the 50% discount extended? That is a question that um, would be based on your state. So I would have to defer to the State Department of 
on employment for you to get that answer. That did not come through on any of this legislation. Okay. Um, we had someone ask about our past webinars. Um, if you guys are interested in watching any of our past webinars, you can visit our website at www.payentry.com. Um, up at the top, there's a tab called webinars, and under the drop down, it'll say past webinars, and that will have all of our recordings. Um, so you guys can definitely see that on the website. All right, next question we had. This is a long one. All right. Um, last year, the EPSL hours were 80. So this year, if additional 80 hours are for employees, if they're already utilizing those 80 hours for COVID, is an additional 80 hours used for vaccine only, or can they be used if the dependent gets COVID? Well, that's actually a couple of different questions. Yeah, it sounds um, like it's just a kind of a clarification on that it EPSL. Is, yeah. It is this. It is still the 80 hours or 10 days maximum. So um, they would only be able to use that. And the the um, four hours counts as part of that 10 days or 80 hours. So if someone wants to do to go get a um, a, a COVID shot, um, you can give them four hours off. But that's going to count against their 80 hours. It's all inclusive. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And if an employee started COBRA in 2019 and their 18 months ended March of 2021, can they extend their coverage now beyond that 18 months? No, they cannot. They would not extend past their normal 18 months. Okay. Um, along those lines, what if you had an employee leave or choose not to return on their own accord? How would this affect the employee retention tax credit? Um, well, you wouldn't be getting a credit for them anymore if they didn't, um, if you weren't paying them. So I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, the, the retention tax credit is for you to pay your employees and you would be submitting hours uh, worked in wages paid during that time to get the credit. So if the person is gone, there's not going to be a credit. Maybe they're referring to they... the COBRA. If they voluntarily leave or they chose not to return, do they still have to notify the COBRA? Uh, yeah, if you're talking about COBRA, um, yes, they voluntarily left, so you don't have to, but most attorneys are advising um, that you do need to re, they would just blanket reoffer it to everyone. Um, and, gotcha. and not consider um, why they left. Gotcha, okay. Um, someone said they thought that the 10 day limit for paid sick leave was to reset after March 31st of 2021. Is that correct? For the EPSL? Um, I don't think so. I think it was a 2021 rule. So, but I can look that up and get back to that person. Okay, sounds good. Um, what is the deadline on the FFCRA extension? Is that now September of 2021? What is the what now? Um, what is the I think deadline? You broke up a little bit there. Sorry about that. <laughs> what is the deadline of the FFCRA extension? Is that now September 20, 2021? Excuse me. September the 30th of 2021. September 30th is now the extension. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Are people on COBRA that aged out of coverage under their parents eligible for coverage under this act? Yes, if they're still within that 18 month time frame. Okay. And do we need to notify employees of the additional 40 COVID hours that are available to them? No, you don't have to. You do. You would just. I mean, you don't have to make a, an announcement about it. Um, you would just continue to their um, when someone needs to be off. Let them know that they will be paid. Okay. Um, you, if you have, if you want to put that in your policies, um, you're welcome to. And if you uh, want to tell your employees that's available, um, you can, but you're not required to. Gotcha. Okay. And is the employer required to pay an employee for sick leave due to COVID related issues or is this optional as stated earlier this year after the previous law expired at the end of January? 
So I think this is, is in regards to FFCRA. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so FFCRA, FFCRA is yeah, it would be optional. If you want to pay them and get the tax credit, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. And is the EPSL optional as well, or is that mandatory? That's optional also. Okay. And one thing, this is just kind of a sidebar for me. Um, so I actually had a client reach out to me earlier this week. And um, any of our clients who are in states that have any type of emergency or um, sick leaves and things like that, you may want to check what the stipulations are on those um, state laws. Because I know in Colorado, Colorado passed the um, Healthy Families Workplace Act last year, and one of the addendums in that act included an emergency leave um, provided during pandemics. And so as of January 1st of this year, all Colorado employers have to also um, provide an additional 10 days, I believe, of um, emergency leave for the pandemic. And that is mandated by the state. That is not optional. Um, so if you have any questions on any state um, leaves or anything that might be mandatory as opposed to the federal ones which are optional, definitely let us know and we can look into those for you. Yes, because a lot of states have come out on their own. When the other one expired, other um, state states put in put their own in place. So yeah, I and the states California. are making them mandatory. They're not making mm -hmm. them optional. So right, yeah. Um, That's a good point, next, Brianna. <laughs> I just the only reason Brianna, I remember is because I had that question this week. <laughs> Brianna is a, a state law expert. Actually, she keeps up with the states um, constantly. Yep, Kathy's our federal guru and I'm the state guru. So if you have any state questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'll definitely make sure that we guide you on the right path. All right, we got a couple more questions. Um, which CRA code would we use to record the four hours of vaccine paid leave? You would use the first one, CRA sick. Okay. Right now, we don't have an extra uh, code for that. I mm -hmm. don't know that that's gonna be developed. I think it is part of the 80 hours, so it would just be CRA sick. Okay. If they do, for whatever reason, decide that they want to create a new code, um, would we notify our clients of that? Um, all you have to do if you want another code anytime is to notify your client advocate and they can create a code that you can use. Okay, perfect. All right, and looks like our last question is, is the ERTC restricted to wages only or does it include employer paid health care for employees? That's a very good question, and yes, it does. It still does include the healthcare piece. And by healthcare, healthcare is defined as anything that you provide as a benefit, like medical, dental, um, those kinds of things um, are included, disabilities included. So you can um, also claim a tax credit for that. Awesome. All right, Kathy, well, thanks for all the great information. That was all the questions, so I'll pass it back over to you. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming today. I hope you uh, got something out of this. Um, if you need a, either one of us, instead of emailing us, you can email hrservices at payentry.com, or you can send um, us a, an email direct. But um, if you have any questions about any of this that you didn't ask today, please do send us an email or give us a call, and we'll be happy to help you. We are here in HR Services to um, assist our clients with um, things that are happening in the, in the wonderful world of HR. So um, make sure that you do reach out to us. And um, if you need assistance with any projects or you're interested in a virtual HR assistant um, in your company, please reach out. Um, to us about that. We have a new package that we're getting ready to roll out um, that I think a lot of people will find interesting. But thanks for attending and have a great day.